We're going to talk about conveyor belt tracking for the remainder of the day. And some of the things we're going to talk about will be a repeat of what we've talked about earlier. Some things will be new. Basically, uh, conveyor belt tracking is a procedure that we use to make sure the conveyor belt runs true in the system when it's empty as well as, as when it's loaded. If a belt doesn't run true in the system when it's empty, your chances of getting run while it's true, uh, run true while it's loaded are just about nil because strange things happen to it. We want you to approach belt tracking as, as a system point of view. You know, is it the belt, is the belt at fault or the structure? Essentially, everything in that conveyor system that touches the belt influences tracking. Whether it's a sticking idler, whether it's build up on the idlers, uh, whether it's misaligned pulleys, all those things, everything in there, the product, the way the product comes on the belt, everything that touches that belt influences the tracking. Essentially, when you're tracking or looking at a belt that's mistracking or a conveyor system where the belt is mistracking, the belt moves off the system in the same place on a consistent basis. So if you stand and watch that conveyor, and at point A on this conveyor, the belt runs off consistently, and that's the only place it runs off, you can be pretty well assured that that's the area where somewhere in that range is where the problem is, and it is a problem with the structure or the conveyor system. It's not a problem with the belt. However, if you stand and watch this, this belt run, and the belt kind of moves off in one area, and just you watch it and it stays off along the full length of the conveyor system, that's a pretty good sign that it's a belt problem or something to do with the belt that is a problem. Primarily, though, if you look at the systems, unless it's a huge system, you can watch it for a while, you get a feel for it, and you'll be able to see whether it's consistently in one place that it runs off or if it moves along the whole system. And like I say, if it's consistent in one place, then you begin to look at the conveyor system somewhere near there. If it can, continues to move on through the system, then you start watching your belt to make sure you have, have it figured out. Basic and primary rules of tracking. The, melt, the belt moves to that end of the idler or pulley that it con comes in contact with first. If you have any doubts about that, take something round, put it on a table, take a book and lay on it, and cock it, and push your book straight ahead, and you'll notice Whatever part that comes in contact with first, that's the direction that that's going to go. The same thing's true with your belt. So it doesn't matter quite often what it is that comes in contact with first in the system. If it has enough influence, it'll move the belt in that direction. Be it build up in the system or be it a cocked idler or whatever. Adjusting belt directions like steering a bike. If you're, riding, if you're riding a bike and you want to turn in this direction, you pull the handlebars to you. What does that do? Turn off in this direction. Now, if you're tracking a piece of a, a conveyor belt, you're looking down on the top of it, belt direction's away from you. If you want the belt to run in that direction, you tilt the idlers in that direction. That means this idler touches the belt first. That'll affect the tracking of the belt. and It'll move the belt in that direction. Generally speaking, when you see an area in your conveyor system where you're having a tracking problem, where you see the problem is not where the problem is actually occurring. That's just a result of the problem somewhere, usually 15, 20, 30 feet down the conveyor system prior to that point. It takes the belt a little while to react to the belt. Steering, you know, you, you knock an idler and make it work in that direction. Now, you've got to be careful when you're doing this. You can't stand on top of an idler or on top of a conveyor system and try to adjust the return idlers when you're facing belt direct, the direction of belt travel. You've got to you got to be in a position where you can can focus on the belt direction the direction of belt travel and then adjust your idlers, either carrying idlers or return idlers. I have a lot of guys have had in the past. We give this little program, and then we go out in the field, and they're working somewhere on the return side, standing there at the tail of the, pull, uh, the conveyor system, and they're adjusting that return idler. 
as though they're looking at the belt direction and actually they're looking up the conveyor instead of in the direction the belts are coming in on the return. So you have to be careful of that. Conveyor items that affect tracking. There's the support truck uh, structure where the support's anchored. There's a frame straight, pulleys and idlers, the take up, off center loading, and build up materials in the system and on the idlers. We mentioned earlier somewhere, I can't remember who was talking about it, but uh, talked about trying to get the belt to track. He went out and looked at the system, and the guy said, Oh, by the way, that's where the forklift hit the, or where the truck hit the uh, conveyor system. The conveyor system skewed, it's not the belt's problem. The belt wants to run in a straight line. When we, and again, talking as we as manufacturers, design a belt, we design it to have all of the tensile members lined up and under equal tension across the width of the belt. So as a result of that, the belt wants to run in a straight direction. And if you put something in the way to keep it from doing that, the belt will, will kind of uh, follow whatever tracking you give to it. As you saw in the opening picture, it would follow that. You couldn't run it that way because as soon as you put heavy tension on it, it'll pop up and try to go straight. But you can get a belt to do some very strange things. Build up on the idlers. We saw this a little earlier, and we didn't talk about it too much. Basically, on re this is a return idler. You can see you have a fair amount of build up here. What's that going to do? Yeah, go ahead. That's right. That's, this is going to be the point where that belt contacts first. And the belt, actually, this actually works like a crown. And the belt wants to ride up on it and move off in that direction. So you need to keep your structure clean. Off-center loading, I think we've pretty well beat that to death. Uh, if there's any question about what it does to you, it just Mother Nature and gravity take over. It'll push the belt off the side of the system. Pulleys and idlers. Your head pulley or your drive pulley and your tail pulley should be square with a frame at a 90 degree angle to the direction of belt travel. And it needs to be level. So not only does it have to be square in the system, but it has to be level in the system. Because if it's not level, what happens? You've got a high point, and it runs to that high point. Once you get your drive and your take-up pulley or your tail pulley, whichever it happens to turn out to be, square and level, lock them in and leave them alone in a trough conveyor system. Today we're going to talk only about trough conveyor systems. We're not going to talk about package handling. So when you get your tail pulley or, or take up pulley, whatever it happens to be, and your head and drive pulley square, lock them in, leave them alone, put red paint on them. If somebody touches them, smack them with a wrench, tell them to get away from it. The only thing you can do with a head pulley or a tail pulley is put camber into a belt. You can't really track them with it, particularly on the carry side. Head pulleys, tail pulleys, should never be used for tracking in a trough conveyor system. Now, I'm saying this, and every one of you will go into the field and you watch a guy track that belt, and he'll use that tail pulley. I'll tell you right now, one of the main reasons the guy's having tracking problems is he's been using that tail pulley to, make tr to do tracking, and he's lost track of the tension in it, and there's no way that either side of that is equal. If he squares that away, he gets it equal, works with the return idlers, his life will be a lot easier and so will yours. Troughing and return idlers should be square with the belt travel and level as well. Now, one of the things that happens to us all when we go out, into, go out in and put a new belt in a conveyor system is the first thing that happens, the guy says, the belt won't run straight, I can't get it to track. You say, well, what have you done? Well, nothing. The last belt ran well. But what he's forgotten is over the years, to accommodate the other belt, he's made slight adjustments and, and corrections in that belt system. Now, every belt is different. Not only if they're, even if they're made by the same manufacturer, their reactions are different. But everything that you do in that system to accommodate one belt will work against you with a new style belt or a different type of belt you put in the system. Okay, so we've talked about screw take-up point not being used to train the belt in a trough conveyor system. Automatic take-ups have to have free movement of the counterweight. 
The counterweight should have sufficient travel to accommodate belt elongation without bottoming, bottoming out. Counterweight boxes should have equal distribution of weight. Let's talk a little bit about uh, our friends up in uh, Wyoming, in Kemmer. They, uh, it's a coal plant, and they have a pretty good size inclined conveyor. <clears throat> and they put a new belt on one of your belts uh, in June. And uh, early this month, they called up with all sorts of tracking problems. And they found out that in their investigations that the counterweight guides weren't even attached down to the ground. And it was jacking that belt back and forth as when it would slam to one side, the whole counterweight, the whole structure would rotate. And then when it would track back to the other side with come along that they were pulling on it, it would track back the other way. And they just, they ended up replacing that belt because they, they tore the edge uh, off just, of a very expensive yeah, piece of Yeah, very belt. expensive belt, and they just panicked over it. So, I mean, they're still not running that well yet. The take-up is the most challenging reason in conveyor system. It's, it's one of the parts of the system that's not stationary. It's designed to move. It's designed to have movement in it. And it, that's, unfortunately, one of those areas where you can have some deflection and some problems. This particular conveyor we're talking about must have... 80 foot of pipe supporting the take up pulley. And it's only, it's three and a half inch pipe and as you stand and look up it, it looks like a snake. It's not rigid enough to support the product, or support the uh, take up pulley. In addition to that, it's skewed, like he says, depends on where, which way the wind's blowing. Now I don't know how many of you are familiar with Wyoming. But the wind always blows in Wyoming. I was there one time when it stopped and all the animals fell over. But uh, Wyoming is, is just one of those places that are windy. This thing is fully exposed, and depending on where the wind comes from, that's the way that tail pull, or that take up pulley twists, and that's the way the belt runs. So it's a challenging region. If your take up weight is, is distributed unequally, you can have more weight on one side than the other, that'll cock your pulley. Generally speaking, what will happen then is your pulley will jam and it won't, it won't move in the system. Wherever it jams is where that belt's going to run. It'll move from side to side. Uh, one of the things that happens in this particular type of take up where it runs on a rail is the rails get, get all corroded or they have pro, uh, product laying all over them and it can't move freely. If in your conveyor system you have an automatic take up and that take up pulley isn't moving freely, you will never be able to get that belt to track. It just won't work properly. Got called out into the desert a few years ago up in Trona, California. Lovely place to go in July. And the guy says, I, can't, I cannot get the conveyor belt to, tra uh, to track. He said, I've tried everything. So we went up and looked at the system and you know, you checked all the idlers, checked the head and tail pulleys, everything's straight and flat, everything looked good. But he just couldn't consistently keep that belt tra uh, tracking. So we got off the system and we went down to take a look at the take up. And lo and behold, the take up's got come alongs on it and it's chained up. So now the take up can't float, therefore, it can't take up the excess belt. Therefore, he has two problems, which he calls me about. My belt, my drive slips, and I can't track the belt. So you walk into his office and say, how come you got it chained off? Well, the last belt we had in there broke, and the take up fell and hit the ground. It was so much trouble, that's not going to happen again. You say, OK, well, you know, whatever. But if you want the belt to run, run straight and you don't want to have to worry about uh, the belt slipping, you better take the chains off your take up. So goofy things happen. Belt problems that create tracking problems. Camber in the carcass, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Unequal tensions across the width of the belt, crooked splices, troughability of the belt, and cupping. We've talked about one or two of those. This is camber, guys. When the belt actually has a curve in it, and goes outside of the of the take or outside of the conveyor system area. This can be done two, one of two ways. You can you can install it in the conveyor with your tail pulley primarily, or the system uh, your 
as you manufacture the belt, you may not get the tensions right across the width. You have more tension on one side than the other. It will cause the belt to run off. One half of 1% is acceptable in the industry, so you lay the belt out, measure the length, measure how much variation there is, divide it out. If you have a half percent, that's supposed to be acceptable. Can you uh, create camber in a belt if it's improperly stored? It can, it can come into a belt. Uh, primarily if you lay a belt on it, say if you store the belt on its side, on concrete or anything else where it can absorb water. Nylon will absorb up to, uh, is it 80%? I can't remember the numbers now. It'll, it'll absorb up to 80%, uh, I think it is, of its weight. So if you lay a belt on its side, most belts in manufacture in the U.S. these days have at least nylon in the crosswise yarn, so it'll absorb that moisture in there. That side, therefore, becomes larger, and then when you put it in the system, you can't get it to track because it'll keep wanting to run that, that high side. And if you keep it up, if you lay it on its side and it's not even in water, it doesn't absorb any water, just the weight will cause it to mushroom out on one side. And again, you'll have tracking problems. You actually put a camber in it. That will eventually come out as you put tension in the system, it'll pull it out. Let's just give you an, an example that might ring home with you a little bit, because I think some of you guys are looking at him like, why can't I adjust the belt with a tail pulley? Everybody else does. And that's the way we've always done it. You know, that standard, always done it that way. Just envision this. Envision your head pulley. Now, I just didn't draw this, you know, exaggerated, obviously. Here's your tail roller, right? So you got your head and your tail. Can you just uh, envision the tension you're going to put onto one side of the conveyor belt that's much greater than the other side? So I have all this extra tension, right, on this side of the conveyor belt, and over a period of time, I'm going to induce the camber into the perfectly good belt because I'm going to stretch those tension yarns, stretch those tension yarns, right? Pretty soon they're going to take a permanent set. So I go back and I fix this problem after a couple years of operation. Well, maybe too late. I might have already ruined the conveyor belt. And hence the reason you never use the head or the tail or even the take up to try to train the belt. The belt's traveling in this direction. What you're doing now is forcing, you're putting the tension on this side. And you'll see it. If you put it in enough, you'll see the belt do this. Because what will happen, you're working on the return side, remember? The belt's coming in. It's going to run to the side it touches first. It's going to run over here. Then as you come out of there, it's going to pick up this tracking effect from the, the carry side. And it's going to pull it back in. So it just kind of does a little banana. And we see it, we see it happen on a pretty regular basis. Fortunately, fortunately, most guys don't put enough tension in it to cause a problem. Can camber be caused by slitting the belt? It can. Uh, if you happen to put a piece of uh, square stock in your <laughs> slitter instead of putting a knife in it, but they say that less than, there is less than 1% camber capability by, by slitting the belt. Generally speaking, if you get problems with camber in the slitting, uh, where, where we see it most often is if you take a used belt out of the field and you've got a 42 inch belt, you want to make a 36 inch belt out of it, and you cut it all off one side. Then you'll see a camber. You get a funny thing happens in a belt. But as far as being able to physically camber the belt, you can do it by, having, by not having sharp enough knives in your, in your uh, slitter. But that's a kind of a camber that you can pull out pretty readily. Because once you put that under tension, then you, you'll be able to equalize the tension across the width of the belt, and it'll come out. If you slit a 60-inch belt down to 230s, and then you don't reverse one of these, so that you get the slit edges with a slit edge. What happens then is your, your tensions are unequal across. Most generally speaking, this is caused by the balance or the weight in the center of the belt. When you, when you design a piece of belt, no matter who you are, 
When you put this belt through the calendar and through the presses, you invariably build a little high spot in the center of the belt. And with this high spot, then you get a little bit of a difference in, in the uh, tensile capabilities of the belt, so it's not equal across there. So if you take this edge and put it next to this edge, then what happens is the belt goes in, it'll run here until it so the splice goes by, and then it moves over here. It'll run there until the next splice comes by and moves back. That has more to do with the, the tension created by the unequal thickness than it does anything else. So basically speaking, what we try to do and what needs to be done, if you're going to build a belt wide and slit it down, then you have to match those edges. You have to match those factory slit edges. We're working on getting a, a procedure in place so that when you slid a belt down the center, that piece that you slid off is automatically turned around and rewound. That solves the problem. You know, you, you can look at the, a wide conveyor belt, say a 60-inch wide belt, you cut it into two 30-inch dimensions, you want to slid it down so it's this factory slab of conveyor belt, you're slitting down two separate belts. If you don't reverse one of the rolls, typically what happens in that slitting process like he's talking about, this edge right, will be vulcanized in again. So in other words, we'll have these two links of conveyor belts spliced together and the, the cut edge here is the same cut edge as here. What they're gonna do for us in the field is gonna create this big camber in the conveyor belt. The only way to get around that is to re-roll one of the belts from the factory. You can put a camber into belt slitting it if you have a slitter that has some really powerful pinch rollers and some guys will misuse those and they'll pressurize it down the conveyor belt. And as it pulls through, they're putting un uneven forces across the width of the conveyor belt, pulling it off to one side or they're cutting it. And you'll see that sometimes, especially on some older style slitters that aren't maybe as sophisticated as the newer ones are. But you can cut one into the belt, surely, you know, if you're not careful. Scoring belt ends. When we, uh, when you get ready to make a splice, whether it's a vulcanized or a mechanical splice, how many of you just take the old square, slap it up against the edge of the belt, and cut across the belt? Oh, a bunch of honest people here today. Yeah, all right. I can guarantee you, you go out in the field and go in almost any quarry or any plant in the field, that's exactly the way they do it. They'll just take the old carpenter square, slap it up the side of the edge of the belt, cut across, and slap it together and they're on their way and they can't figure out why the belt runs like it does. Basically guys, after you've run a belt for a while, the edges aren't square any longer. And I can pretty much guarantee you when it comes from the plant, the edges aren't really square either. So the easiest way and the best way to get a, a good square edge for your splice is to use the center line method. You measure across the belt about every foot for about four or five feet and you find a common center where you find the center. Now you can cheat on this. If your 36 inch belt is, or your 30 inch belt now is kind of worn down a little bit on the edge, you just move your tape over till you have 30 inches and then mark 15. It'll be pretty close to the center of the belt. You don't have to sit there and figure out all the, the uh, math on the fractions and such. But you measure and get that center line about four or five places along the belt. Then you take either a straight edge or a chalk line and line up the common marks. Get most of them lined up, snap it. Then you can use your square and use your square off the center line. That will give you the best straight edge for a splice. Michael, how, how far out of square does it have to be before you got problems with tracking? Not much. You'd be surprised. A quarter inch out of square on a splice that's running at a fairly good speed you'll notice it, you'll see it on the system. So a lot of guys will just throw a belt together real quick, measuring off the edge, you know, using the edge as a straight edge to put the two splices together. Chances are, sooner or later, you're gonna have crooked splices. You may not even know it for a while, but the customer may notice it, you know? It doesn't take much. So just, again, covering the, uh, using the center line, T-square off the center line, then making your cut. Um, some folks like to get a little more fancy with it. They'll use an arc method. You go back uh, quite a ways in your belt, put in a nail, 
take your twine, run it across the width of the bell. Again, you're working off the center line. And then you move up closer and make another arc. And where those arcs intersect, you run your, your line, straight line across there and you have a good square. Again, uh, if you want to make sure your, your splice is square, you set up across the splice area, find the center line, go back, I like to go back 25 or 30 inches, either side of the, uh, the splice, make a mark on both sides of the belt and then measure diagonally across. And that number should be the same on both diagonals. Make sure you're using the same side, <laughs> same side of the uh, tape when you're measuring as well. Many a splice has gone already by that. Cupping. This little puppy here will cause you real serious problems on the return side. We talked earlier, if you don't have contact with those idlers, full contact with those idlers, you can't track that belt. Well, if you get cupping in the belt, and the belt comes up on those points, you have no control over it. If this happens in your system, you have a few options you can do with. You can do what we call reaving, where you just take and it's up to you how many you do this on, but you go over, and then you go under a trough or a return idler, go along, and you may do this about every third idler, go under it. What this does is it forces the belt down, tie it onto the pulley. You have to modify your hangers but it will, cut, it will make you, your belt lay flat on those idlers, so now you have some control on them, and you can track it on the return side. How many of you run into trouble with this? And the real problem is when they're using those little rubber uh, return idlers, rubber uh, tire return idlers, this point will get up on it. It'll actually burrow down in, and it just creates a little pocket for itself. It stays in there until it burns through, or actually wears through the shafts on the pulleys. 